Let's now consider what is one of the really most important challenges in all of networking, one of the most fundamental challenges, and that is how do two distributed entities reliably communicate over a channel which itself is unreliable, that can lose messages, that can corrupt or reorder messages. Now this is really one of my favorite topics to teach in networking because I think there are a lot of deep ideas here and I think there's also a lot of intuition that we can draw on because we as humans have the need to communicate reliably with each other. I think this is a top 10, probably a top five topic in terms of importance in all of networking. And here's how we're gonna proceed. We're gonna start with a very simple initial channel model, actually a perfect channel model. And then we're gonna start introducing increasingly realistic assumptions that messages can be lost, that bits can be flipped, that messages can be reordered. And we'll see the kind of protocol mechanisms that we need to recover from these kinds of impairments. I think you're gonna really enjoy this section, so let's get started. So here's the scenario we're going to consider. We have a sending process and a receiving process, and the sending process simply wants to send data to the receiving process through a reliable channel. And let's note here that the reliable channel is unidirectional. We wanna be able to reliably send simply from a sender to a receiver. That's the abstraction we wanna implement. Now, when we talk about the implementation of this abstraction, this is where it gets interesting. And as we see here, the implementation is gonna be in the form of a transport layer protocol. There are two sides to that protocol. There's a sender side of the reliable data transfer protocol and a receiver side. And the sender and receiver sides are going to be communicating with each other over an unreliable channel that we see down on the bottom. And notice that message exchanges between the protocol entities is going to be bidirectional. The sender side of the transport protocol will send things to the receiver side and the receiver side of the transport protocol will reply back and send things to the sender side of the reliable data transfer protocol. So even though at the application layer, we're implementing unidirectional transfer between the sending and receiving processes within the protocol itself, we see that the sender and the receiver are each communicating with each other over a bi-directional, unreliable channel. Here are a couple of things to keep in mind as we develop our reliable data transfer protocol. First of all, the complexity of the sender and receiver side of the protocol are gonna depend very strongly on the characteristics of this unreliable channel. Can it lose messages? Can it corrupt messages? Can data be reordered within that unreliable channel? And here's a point of view to keep in mind. It's really easy for us as humans to look at the sender and receiver together and to see what's happening, to say, oh, I see that message was lost, therefore this entity has to take a given action. But think about it from the sender's point of view. How does the sender know whether or not its transmitted message over that unreliable channel got through? That only happens if the receiver somehow signals back to the sender that in fact the receiver received that message. The key point here is that one side does not know what's going on at the other side or what's going on in the channel. It's sort of as if there was a curtain between them. Everything they know about the other side can only be learned through the sending and receiving of messages. So before starting to develop a protocol, let's look a little bit more closely at the interfaces available to the protocol, the API, if you will. This diagram shows the interfaces above and below the transport layer on both the sending and the receiving sides. On the sending side, data is being passed down from an application layer process to the transport layer. The transport layer is then going to add a header together with the data to create a transport layer segment, send that over the unreliable channel to the receiver. On the receiving side, when a segment does pop out, it will have a header and also a data component to the segment. The receiving side will then deliver data up to the receiving process at the application layer in such a way that every piece of data sent down from the sending side is delivered exactly once and in order to the receiving process. So let's get started in developing our reliable data transfer protocol, which we'll call RDT for Reliable Data Transfer Protocol. <laughs> you know, you need a good acronym for a protocol like HTTP or TCP or UDP or IP. We'll develop RDT. 
And remember, we're going to be looking only at unidirectional transfer here between sender and receiver, but control is going to flow in both directions. Now, if we're going to develop a protocol, we'll need some way to specify what that protocol is. How is it that we're going to do that? Well, we could write text, but text as we know is subject to misinterpretation and might also be incomplete. For example, you might write out a textual specification and then think, oh yeah, actually I forgot about that case. What we need here is a more formal way to specify a protocol. In fact, with a formal specification, we may even be able to prove properties about that specification, uh, but that's actually an advanced topic that we won't get into here. We'll start here by adopting a fairly simple protocol specification technique known as finite state machines. And as the name suggests, a central notion of finite state machines is this notion of state. Well, this notion of state might seem really pretty simple and pretty intuitive, but in fact, it's pretty hard to define precisely. What do we really mean when we say an RDT sender is in a given state or a receiver is in a given state? Maybe some real world analogies might help here. We might think about a link being in a transmitting state or in an idle state. We might think of a light bulb being in an on state or an off state. But even after we've mastered this notion of state, we're also going to have to think about this notion of there being transitions between states and those transitions happening because of an event that takes place. And we're also going to have to think about actions that are taken by the system. Well, before heading into networking, why don't we take a simple example, let's say of the light bulb and see if that can really help us drive home this notion of state, the notion of events and the notion of actions. So in the case of the light bulb, there are two states, on and off. The events are to press the on side of the switch or press the off side of the switch. And these events cause transitions between the on and off states. When the light is in the off state and the on switch is pressed, the state of the light bulb transitions to the on state and emits a light. When the bulb is in the on state and the off switch is pressed, it goes to the off state and the light stops. And for completeness, we should probably specify what happens when the switch is in the on state and on is pressed and similarly for the off state. Well, let's get back to networking now and the challenge of developing a reliable data transfer protocol. And we're gonna to wanna to specify a separate finite state machine for both the sender and for the receiver. We'll start with the simplest case possible, an underlying unreliable channel that actually in fact is perfect. No segments are going to be lost, corrupted, duplicated, or reordered. The sender is just going to send and it's going to pop out the other side, perhaps after some delay, perfectly. As we mentioned earlier, we're going to want separate finite state machines for the sender and the receiver. And because this is a perfect channel, the actions are really simple. The sender is just going to send data into the underlying channel and the receiver is going to read data from the underlying channel. Let's take a look at the finite state machines for these. The sender finite state machine is simple. There's just a single state where the sender is waiting for a call from above. Recall the earlier discussion we had about the interface between the application layer and the transport layer below it on the sending side. So an event happens, RDT send data, that call is made to the transport layer sender. The transport layer actions then are to take the piece of data, make a packet out of that data, and then send that packet into the underlying unreliable data transfer medium via the UDT send operation. The finite state machine for the RDT 1.0 receiver is also simple, again, just a single state. And here the receiver is waiting for a call from below. That's the case where there'll be an arriving data packet. The event RDT receive where a packet is actually transferred is the event that happens on that event the receiver extracts the data from the packet and delivers the data to the application layer above. Now that RDT1 protocol was ridiculously simple because the underlying channel between the sender and receiver itself was reliable. So the sender and receiver didn't have to do anything more than really send and receive. But now let's think about what the sender and receiver need to do when the underlying channel has impairments. In the simplest case, Say that the channel can flip bits in the transmitted message, rendering the message unintelligible at the receiver. 
Well, before we develop an RDT 2.0 protocol to deal with errors, flip bits in the communication channel, it'd be a good idea for you to sort of sit back now and think about how do you, as a human being, what protocol mechanisms do you use to communicate reliably with someone? And I think when you think about it, you'll see that there really are reliable human-to-human -human communication protocol and protocol mechanisms in place. And after you pause to think about that, when you come back, we'll take a look at a few movie clips that show human communication protocol mechanisms in operation. I understand what you are saying. Yes, sir. I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying, George. I understand now. <laughs> My name is Axel Foley. And uh, what is pertaining? I didn't understand what you said. Pertaining, what it's meaning regarding. Oui, monsieur. Do you have a rim? A rim? What? You said, do I have a rim? I know perfectly well what I said. I said, do you have a rim? You mean, do I have a room? That is what I have been saying, you fool. I love that Pink Panther movie. Well, what are the protocol mechanisms that we just saw in those in those few short clips. We certainly saw the use of acknowledgements, saying, yes, I got your message. The use of negative acknowledgements, no, I didn't get your message, and retransmission, the restatement of a message that got garbled in transmission from sender to receiver. When we come back to the RDT 2.0 protocol, we're gonna see all of those mechanisms in place and in use. Okay, so let's get going on building our RDT 2.0 Reliable Data Transfer Protocol for dealing with the case that the channel may introduce bit errors into the message. As we noted before, we're going to use checksums to detect bit errors. And here in English is how the protocol is going to work. The question is really, how are we going to recover from errors? And we'll use some of the mechanisms that we just saw in those film clips. We'll use acknowledgments for the receiver to explicitly tell the sender that a packet was received okay. We'll also use negative acknowledgments for the receiver to tell the sender, hey, I received something, but it was in error. And if something's received in error, the sender is going to retransmit the packet on the receipt of that kind of negative acknowledgement mechanism. The operation of our sender, the operation of our RDT 2.0 sender is going to be what we might call a stop and wait type of behavior. The sender is going to send a packet and then simply wait for the receiver response. Here's the finite state machine specification for the RDT 2.0 sender. There are two states. In one state, the wait for call from above state, the sender is waiting for data to be dropped down from the application layer. In the other state, the wait for ACK or NAC state, the sender is waiting to receive either an acknowledgement or a negative acknowledgement from the receiver. Now let's take a look at the events that can happen and the actions taken by the sender. When a piece of data is passed down from the application layer via the RDT send API call, the sender is going to make a packet and then simply send that packet via the UDT send API. When the sender is in the wait for ACK or NAC state and a packet is received and the packet's an acknowledgement, the sender simply transitions back to the wait for call from above state because it's received an acknowledgement and it knows that that packet's been received by the receiver. On the other hand, when the sender's in the wait for ACK or NAC state and a packet is received and it's a NAC, the sender's simply going to retransmit that packet via another call to UDT send and passing it the send packet that it had previously created. Once back in the wait for call from above state, the sender is going to do exactly that. Wait for another call for RDT send. Now let's take a look at the finite state machine specification for the RDT 2.0 receiver. There's just one state here, as in the case of RDT 1.0. The receiver is basically waiting for a call from below, the arrival of a packet. So if a packet arrives as indicated through RDT receive and that packet's corrupt, the receiver is going to send a negative acknowledgement, a NAC, back to the sender. On the other hand, if a packet's received and it's not corrupt, we're going to extract the data from the packet, deliver the data to the application layer above, and then finally send a positive acknowledgement back to the sender via the UDT send call. Let's now take a look at RDT 2.0 in operation for the case that there are no bit errors detected. 
The sender and the receiver start in the red states that are shown here, their initial states. And the first action that happens is that RDT send is called. Data is passed down from the application layer at the sender side. The sender creates a packet and sends that packet via UDT send over to the receiver. The sender to receiver packet is then received at the receiver. It's not corrupt in this case. So the receiver extracts data from the packet, delivers the data to the application layer, and sends an acknowledgement packet back to the sender. The sender then transitions back to the wait for call from above state. And the receiver, of course, remains in the wait for call from above state. Now let's take a look at RDT 2.0 in operation for the case that a packet from sender to receiver is actually corrupted. The sender and receiver again start in their start states. The first action again is that RDT send is called at the sender side, data is passed down, a packet is made, and that packet is then sent to the receiver. The sender then transitions to the wait for ACK or NAC state. That packet is then received at the receiver. It's determined to be corrupt, and the receiver then sends a NAC packet back to the sender. That NAC packet is received, and the action taken by the RDT 2.0 sender is simply to retransmit the packet. The retransmitted packet is then received at the receiver. It's determined to not be corrupt, so data is extracted. Data is delivered up to the application layer, and since it's been received correctly, the receiver then sends an ACK packet back to the sender, and then the sender receives the ACK packet and transitions back to the state waiting for a call from above. The sender and receiver are then back in their original states and the cycle can continue. Well, we've seen how RDT 2.0 can recover from flip bits on that sender to receiver transmission, but there's a fatal flaw here. Can you see what it is? Here's the issue. What happens if an ACK or a NAC is corrupted? We actually haven't taken care of that. In human communication, it's as if I say something to you and you reply back to me, oh, blah, blah, blah. it got garbled. And here's the question. What should I as the sender do when I got that arbled ACK or NAC back from you? I don't know whether or not you received my initial transmission correctly or incorrectly. If I simply retransmit, I'm gonna send you another copy of the data. If you'd received it then correctly, You'll take that second transmission and treat it like a new piece of data when in fact it was a retransmission. On the other hand, if you had sent me a NAC and that NAC was garbled, then you really do want another copy of the message that I had originally sent you, and so I should retransmit. So what the sender will do in the case of RDT 2.0 is that it will retransmit a packet if an corrupted ACK or NAC is received and will add a sequence number to each packet so that the receiver can detect duplicates. If I send you a retransmission, I will send you a packet with the same sequence number. If you, the receiver, receive a duplicate, you simply discard it, meaning you do not deliver the data up to the application layer because the application layer does not want two copies of the same piece of data. RDT 2.1 is a stop and wait protocol and uses a one-bit sequence number. We'll note that the sender finite state machine here now has four states rather than two states that we saw in RDT 2.0. The top two states are for when RDT is sending a packet with sequence number zero, and the bottom two states are for when RDT is sending a packet with sequence number one. Now let's look at the transitions between states, the events that happen and the actions taken. And let's go clockwise around the states, first looking at the case of no corruptions. The RDT 2.1 sender begins in a state that we'll label as the waiting for call zero from above state. This means that when in the state, the sender is going to include a sequence number zero on the next packet that it sends. The sender is eventually passed data from the application layer. It makes a packet with sequence number zero and then sends that packet. The sender then transitions to a state where it's waiting for an ACK or a NAC for that sequence number zero packet. So let's say that the sender receives an uncorrupted ACK packet that it's been waiting for. It then transitions to the waiting for call one from above state, meaning that the next packet it sends will have a sequence number of one. 
The senders eventually pass data from the application layer again. It makes a packet again, but this time with sequence number one, and sends that packet. Then let's say it receives an act for that packet, so it transitions back to the waiting for call zero from above state, and the cycle can then repeat. Let's now look at what happens when bit errors occur, either in the sender to receiver packet or in the ACK or NAC itself, which is corrupted on the way back to the sender. If the sender's in the wait for ACK or NAC zero state and a NAC or a corrupted packet is received, it will retransmit the last packet it sent, which given the state it's in, will have sequence number zero. Similarly, if the sender is in the wait for ACK or NAC one state and a NAC or a corrupted packet, is received, it will retransmit the last packet it sent this time, which will have a sequence number of one. And finally, let's look at the RDT 2.1 receiver. It has two states indicating whether the receiver is waiting for a sequence number zero packet or a sequence number one packet to be received. So let's start with the receiver in the waiting for zero from below state. If a packet's received, it's not corrupt, and it has sequence number zero, this is just what the receiver was looking for. So it extracts the data, passes it up to the application layer, creates an ACK packet, and then sends the ACK back to the sender. There's a mirror set of operations when the receiver is in the waiting for one from below state. Now let's consider what happens when the receiver is waiting for a packet with sequence number one and a corrupted packet is received. Well, in this case, as we talked about earlier, it sends a NAC. If it's waiting for a sequence number one packet and a sequence number zero packet arrives, it's going to send an ACK packet back, not a NAC packet. Now, you might want to think a bit about the sequence of past events that could actually result in this happening. There are a mirrored set of events and actions that can happen when the receiver is in the wait for zero from below state on the other side of the finite state machine diagram. So that wraps up our discussion of RDT 2.1, and we just summarize a few of the highlights of RDT 2.1 with respect to RDT 2.0 here. Notice that we use both ACKs and NACs here. It's actually possible to create a NAC-free version of RDT 2.1, that is a protocol that only uses ACKs. You can read about RDT 2.2 in the text that does exactly that. It doesn't add any fundamentally new protocol mechanisms, it just uses the existing mechanisms in a slightly different way. When we get to TCP, we'll see that it uses only ACKs along with sequence numbers, checksums, and retransmissions. Well, there we have it, a complete and correct communication protocol for communicating reliably over a channel in which bits can be flipped and packets flowing in either direction. Let's summarize again the mechanisms that we encountered to make this possible. Certainly, there's the use of error detection bits, like a checksum to detect flip bits in packets. We saw ACK and NAC mechanisms. We saw retransmission upon detected errors. And then finally, we saw the use of sequence numbers to detect retransmitted segments. Well, we're almost done, but there's still one case we haven't handled. What happens if packets are actually lost within the communication channel, within the medium connecting sender to receiver? That's coming up in the next section.